Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm so moved today to have uh, the turnout and attention of so many people around the globe. Um, my name is Sahad Baba. I'm the executive director of Just Vision. We just opened the doors, so we're going to let people go ahead and get settled into our virtual Zoom room. As that is happening, um, please feel free to enter your name and tell us where you're calling in from in the chat box. We have folks calling in from across the United States and around the world, and it's incredibly humbling. London, Vancouver, Italy, England, Rochester, Scotland, Chicago, Chicago Mexico, Mexico, New Orleans, Brooklyn, Oakland. This is a really incredible and meaningful turnout. Thank you everyone for joining us. Most importantly, thank you Basil and Rula for joining us during this incredibly challenging time in Israel-Palestine. Um, as a little bit of background, uh, again, for those who have just joined us, my name is Sahad Baba. And I'm the executive director of Just Vision. We're a team of journalists, filmmakers, and human rights advocates who fill a media gap on Israel-Palestine through storytelling, journalism, and strategic, strategic audience engagement. I'm honored to be co-hosting today with my partner in making good trouble, Hagai Matar, executive director of 972 Advancement of Citizen Journalism, who is also um, the co-publisher of Local Call, which Just Vision uh, co-publishes together with 972. Um, we are a team of Palestinian, Israeli, and North and South American um, journalists and filmmakers, and uh, Basil al Adra um, is a, both an activist and journalist from local, for Local Call, um, an activist based out of Masafariyata. Rula Salame is one of our senior team members at Just Vision, director of our education and outreach efforts in Palestine, a veteran journalist who helped found the Palestinian Broadcasting Corporation, as well as a community organizer based out of East Jerusalem. Many of us are coming to this call today, um, still processing and taking in the killing of Shireen Abu Akhle, a journalist for Al Jazeera, Palestinian American citizen, who was shot by the Israeli military during a raid in the Janine refugee camp, according to eyewitnesses who were with her, including one of her colleagues who was shot in the back within feet from her. This also comes on the heels of the Israeli high court's ruling to green light the forced displacement of Palestinian communities in Masafariyata, a region in the West Bank comprised of several villages. This displacement will constitute the largest forced removal of Palestinians since 1967 in the West Bank. For these reasons, this conversation today are both urgent and important. They hit very close to home for our team at Just Vision, at 972, at Local Call. Um, and it's incredibly meaningful to have your attention today um, to share more a little about the recent Israeli court decision and what that means, as well as both the, the opportunities of journalism and storytelling in this crucial moment and the risks that journalists really do face on the ground and particularly Palestinian journalists who often come under fire as we've devastatingly seen in the last week. Um, with that, I want to um, thank you all again for joining us. And I wanna turn this over to Hagai um, to set the stage and kick us off in a conversation with Basil and Rula. Um, for all of you who are wondering what we're about to experience for the next hour, um, Hagai and I will um, have a few questions for Rula and Basil to help us get started in the conversation. We'll then be opening this up to questions from the audience that we'll be asking you to go ahead and drop into the Q&A box. Um, for those of you, most of us are familiar with Zoom at this point, um, given the many years that we've become familiar with it and lived on it. Um, but for those who are trying to find the Q&A box, it is at the bottom of the screen. 
um, there's going to be two little boxes that's, and one that says Q&A, and you're going to go ahead and click that, and that's where you could answer your, your questions. So with that, um, Hagai, please take it away. Thank you, Suhad, and, um, and welcome, everyone. Thank you from, for joining us from really all over the place. It's uh, exciting to see all the locations people are mentioning here. Um, and uh, Bas and Rula, especially the two of you, thank you for joining. Um, my name is Hagai Matar, I'm the Executive Director of 972. Um, and basically what, as Suhad said, what we're going to do today is talk about Pasapa Diata. And as Suhad mentioned, the biggest event that recently happened was the High Court decision, the Israeli High Court decision um, on Masafa Yata. This is basically the end of a long legal battle that has been waging for over 20 years um, in the Israeli High Court. Basically, the question that was to be decided was the fate of um, between eight and 12 communities, Basil will talk about that later, that live in this region of the South Hebron Hills, the very uh, south tip of the West Bank. Um, and the question at hand was, Israel has announced or declared a large part of that area, a closed military zone in the 80s, and basically, um, or firing zone to be precise, and basically said that people living there are living inside a firing zone that's meant for training for Israeli troops, and therefore they need to be removed. The petitions have said, we actually live here. These uh, firing zones, as firing zone orders were uh, initiated on our backs. We were here first. And to say now that we're intruding into a firing zone um, is absurd and, and is actually something that constitutes a war crime. The High Court, after a very long time of deliberations, basically reached two. Um, major decisions. One is to say that the international law doesn't forbid the forced transfer of people, that even if it does, then it doesn't really apply in this case, because it's not enough people to be cons uh, considered forced transfer, even though we are talking about hundreds of families, thousands of people. So that was one kind of legal argument made. And then the other was the saying that people actually didn't live there, that there was no one there, the land was clear, the firing zone was declared in a desert where people did not live. Uh, and with that, I want to take us to the first question to Basil, who is a resident who grew up and spent his entire life in the South Hebron Hills around Masafa Um, And Basil, if you can tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up in that area, um, what does the community look like? What does the struggle look like? And what does it look like now post this ruling, what does the community feel like? Um, where are we going next? Hey, thank you, Haggai. Thank you, Suhad. Thanks for the people who organized this event. It's important. Uh, my name is again Basil Adra from Masafariyata community. I'm an activist and journalist, writer for 972 magazine. <clears throat> To answer your question, yeah, I was born in 1996 uh, and I grew up, find myself under the rule that my area is divided to be uh, Area C, where we are under the control of the an occupation army, a foreigner soldiers who come control everything about our life. If I, if I want to go uh, to the entrance of my, my village, my community to go out to reach uh, the city of Yatta, where we need to buy our stuff, where we go visiting uh, relatives, uh, visiting uh, friends in the city. I mostly find flying checkpoints of soldiers who are sitting there, uh, checking our bodies, our cars, making us waiting under the sun. A uh, few hundred meters away from my home, uh, there is two illegal outposts and settlements that were built on 2000 and committing brutal attacks. I've been witnessing and uh, lately been attacked also uh, and documenting these uh, settlers' attacks. Uh, within that, when I was like nine years old, uh, I watched the, uh, an eight soldiers beating brutally my father because he was grazing in a land 
that they are telling him it's not he's not allowed to be there and he insists to be there because he say he for him it's our land and he need, he need to to graze there they beated him and arrest him within that in that years i i watched also bulldozers with soldiers entering to my community demolishing a mosque and the house of uh my my friend family and uh, other neighbor like house so th these scenes i saw like when i was a child as well like uh, the, my family my parents especially and other uh, people from the community led uh, an unveiling resistance against this thing to go to 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 the farmland where the settlers try to control it within the their violence or with the power of the soldiers on the ground by beating anyone go close there chasing the people even they put poison for our sheep for our animals in the fields one day and we lost many of our sheep and we were poisoned because the, the poison go to the milk and arrive to our bodies and i remember myself going like to protest in the front of the the israeli police station which is also set up like in a settlement of Kiryat Arba and Hebron. So this, like, to be honest, how I grew up and what I see in my life, and it continued. And now it's go like uh, uh, even worse. So to talk about this decision, as you mentioned, in the 80s, the army decided to do uh, a firing zone on like 32,000 dunums of Masaf Riyata, where like 12 villages uh, are existing here and existing since centuries. Suddenly they created like, they decided that this is gonna be uh, a firing zone for the army to do a training. We we believe because we see we're living here. Uh, I grew up here. I see there's no reason for them like to do a military firing zone for the army to do trainings. The goal is very clear is to expel us out of our land but they need to justify it. So they find this a uh, brutal uh, tool and uh, this lie to, to, to declare our land as a firing zone to chase out, us out of it. For that, they used a lot of techniques. One of it and the most I focus and I, I document it, it's like demolishing the homes. Uh, and especially every, almost every week in the recent years, I go, follow uh, a process of demolitions that the army come to commit here in the in the villages of Masafir Yatta, going from a structure to another. I see the soldiers smiles, the uh, civilian administration, like laughing and having fun. And even sometimes like what happened in Wednesday, like they take out the flocks of sheep, the, the, they ask the bulldozer to start demolishing it. The, the the women who, who's like 66 years old behind like the, this building sitting up sitting down sorry and crying and there was the guy of the civilian administration from the army who grabbed like a, a lamp and asked the other guy to take a photo of it and laugh that he's taking photo of the sheep with him while not while well, he don't see what he's doing and what he's committing. And he have been doing this for years and he's known uh, to, to everyone in, in Masafir Yatta. Even like when when his car coming with bulldozer, like children from a school the other day were like shouting with his name, cursing him, shouting at him. Like, and this is like very crazy scenes to, to see. And more it's like to see the mothers and children like taking out their bags and their clothes, their mattresses out of the home and the crying and shouting while you see like flocks of soldiers uh, carrying their like gun machine, pushing everyone, getting close to the building away. They don't care to push and punish and arrest people. They don't care even to see people crying and just to commit like a, a demolition. Uh, and a demolition like that took place on Wednesday was really crazy. Over than 20 structure almost were whipped out from the ground. I, I saw families who I stayed with them all, all the day from the bulldozer come there, even after they left, even from a family who took the tent of the sheep and set it up for themselves to sleep 
inside that night and until now. But it, it changed, to be honest, after the, the decision, because now I ask the people, what's, what's your plan? What you gonna, do you want to, to, to build this more? They told me, we don't know. Like, we don't know if they, if they even will leave us to, to sit here in this tent, if they don't come tomorrow with a truck like grab our stuff or our sheep and confiscate it or throw it like uh, on the highway uh, and even if not like come to arrest us uh, they really like people living in a, in, in, in a worried situation in the night and in the day in the morning they tell me like we sit we're sitting here we graze in this field but we don't know if tomorrow morning we can wake up and do the same thing uh, if we wake up and coming back to sleep in this in this tent or sleep in this in this room or in this cave so now it's really like a situation uh, and this decision create a fear for the people they are saying the sentences of they're gonna stay uh, they will not leave it's their home because this is the truth but people fe feeling they don't have that much power to resist the this new decision uh, because for like two decades, for 23 years, they've been facing and resisting uh, harsh like conditions uh, from the from from that the army like oppose it on them by demolishing their homes, bulldozing roads, demolishing schools, preventing them to to graze in so many areas and cutting them from to have like cutting the water pipes and prevent them to have water or electricity supply. So they've been like for 23 years fighting in the legal battle, but as well facing a very harsh conditions uh, that, that we've been like updating and writing about it. So now with this decision, it's worse. And uh, we, 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 like me myself, we don't know what's, what they're planning for in the next uh, few days or few weeks or few months. Basil, thank you. Before we go to Rula, I just wanted to follow up on, on everything that you just shared. Given the recent developments, both with the Israeli High Court decision, but also with the um, demolitions that have been taking place with the uh, violence that the community has been experiencing, um, both by settlers, oftentimes with the military. How is the community responding to this in this moment um, to what is taking place? Yeah, first thing they tell me, like, we don't have other home to go to. Uh, people, like, like, a lot of them were shocked. Like, for me, I, I, I understood, to be honest, because of the activism, because I'm also, like, uh, see in other places and I know what the, the occupation is doing. But some simple people, like, they're really sh in shock of what happened because people in the court brought all evidence to prove that this is their land. They ask like simple questions. It is our land. If we can't build uh, a home in my land and the shelter sheep for my sheep in my land, where I can do this, where I can build it if they expel me out of here, who gonna accept and give me his land to, to live in it and to, to create my life there. Uh, and it's a community, it's a history and it's a culture. They're not just going to destroy houses and sheep shelters. Uh, and this thing, you know, it's a it's a community that have that exists there since ever, and the culture of the people, the traditions are different. So, but that that's what they told me. Like it is like they're gonna stay, they're gonna stay fast in 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 their in their land. They told me even we will not leave anywhere else except if we if they change our place from above the ground to under it. Uh, and we will not move away from here. But at the same time, I can see the, the weakness because they keep the, here on the ground, there is, there is those soldiers and the settlers who are creating the facts on the ground and just receiving the same condemns and statements since the 80s, since Israel started to build settlements in the West Bank, the, the international community sending the same statements and condemns. Uh, but not taking any serious action. And the, in the ground, a lot of facts have been changed. 
because of this silence, because of the international community allow it, because America and the European Union is allowing it to happen and allowing the settlers and the, the army to expel Palestinians and to build more settlements. The people like the, their reactions really now different than the demolitions I, I, I saw before, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, but they, they, they keep telling me that they, 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 they're going to stay here in their land. Thank you, Basil. Rula, I want to bring this over to you. Um, you have been covering as a journalist uh, a number of communities across Israel-Palestine from um, everything that is taking place in East Jerusalem in places like Sheikh Sharah and Silwan to the Jordan Valley. You also um, recently have been focusing your coverage around Masa Feriata and South Hebron Hills and the situation with um, that children face in light of um, uh, the lack of investment in education and so forth in this broader context of occupation and, and apartheid and inequality. And so if you can share a little bit about um, how what we're seeing in Masa, Masa Feriata relates to and connects to the bigger picture um, of what we're seeing across Israel-Palestine, that would be incredibly helpful. Thank you, Suhad. Um, hi. Uh, thank you um, uh, to Basel also for all the um, information that he's providing us with. I think uh, I think Masafer Yatta is a unique place because the situation after the court decision is really really very hard. I don't know how the people can handle it because uh, we are not. Uh, fighting uh, a group of people or uh, settlers alone. We are fighting the Israeli government and the settlers and the, uh, uh, the military orders. And every time Israel want to confiscate more lands, they pretend that they will have a firing zone. And then uh, easily they can push people out from their lands. The situation in Musafir's uh, Yatta is a little bit similar to uh, the situation in the Jordan Valley area, where is also there is a lot of uh, settlements and expanding for the settlements for the last 20 years. And now we are talking about also uh, the soldiers with the settlers, what they are doing to people to prevent them from uh, uh, staying there in, on their lands and uh, uh, even pushing them back because they are threatening them day and night. We are not talking about the firing zone also. We are not talking about what the military, what the soldiers are doing to the people there. We are talking about, uh, about uh, part of uh, um, the, um, uh, what Israel is, what the Israeli government is doing is also, they are dividing the work between them and the settlers. And I heard and I saw uh, um, different cases and not only in Masafir Yatta, also in the Jordan Valley area, where it's the, the border with Jordan, where it's, uh, um, uh, we are talking about uh, the Jordan Valley, which is uh, the food basket for uh, the West Bank. We are talking about, uh, about the agriculture, uh, agriculture land that Israel confiscated uh, 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 during uh, Oslo and after Oslo. They are really uh, how they are treating people. They, people are not allowed to do any uh, 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 work on their lands. They are not allowed to bring water. Imagine that this area, uh, which is the Jordan Valley, is the best area full of water uh, uh, and different water resources. People there, uh, the Palestinians, are not allowed to use uh, the water resources there. And they are not allowed to bring or to buy water from any place. If uh, the uh, settlers or the, the soldiers are watching the people bringing water or trying to fix the roads so they can go and uh, uh, easily to their homes, to their, to their tents, most of them, they are Bedouins and they sit on, in, they live in tents, they are not allowed even to fix the, the um, roads. And I can say um, that I have the experience there and I went there to see one of the schools that was that received a, a, a demolition order uh, before a few months. And I saw the kids, we are talking about children between the age of six and, and uh, 14 and 15. They are using the donkeys, donkeys to come uh, from the tent 
to the school and back from the school back to the tent to their tent because there's no buses or cars the the roads it's not we can't even say that it's road they are not allowed to uh, uh, to do any work on the road or to fix it so their kids can go uh, uh, um, to their schools easily we are talking about uh, um, uh, and they were sharing about different, different uh, uh, hard situation that they are telling us. We don't know if we until when we can handle the situation, because I heard from them that even they are confiscating their chips, they are uh, taking their properties, they are uh, they do not allow them uh, to work on their lands. They are not uh, um, allow them to bring even the electricity and the water pumps. They are not allowed to do this because they are pushing them towards leaving what uh, the settlers even uh, are doing which is worse than what the uh, the soldiers are doing they have their dog dogs and they just uh, uh, leave the dogs in the evening and imagine the kids even can't play outside the tent because they are afraid from the dogs i hear the stories that people can't imagine this is all similar to what is going on Musafar Yatta and Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan maybe different actions from the Israeli government and from the police and the soldiers and the settlers but I mean the the, the aim uh, of the Israeli government is to push Palestinians out from their homes and from their land and to pretend uh, uh, that this land is empty and we can use it and now what is happening is every time and they are pushing Palestinians in from in their tents and the Bedouins from the area they are sitting. They are trying to bring uh, settlers, even like a, a family or one one uh, uh, settler, to sit in this small caravan. And he they they will provide him with water. They will provide him with the electricity. They will provide him with the security to help him and support him. And imagine the Palestinians who were born and raised in these areas are not allowed. The problem, as uh, as Basel said, it's the international community. It's the American government who are providing Israel with everything they need. They are not watching what what is happening to the Palestinians. They are not coming and visiting and and uh, 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 searching the truth. And they are not even uh, writing about what they see. Even the media there, it's not allowed to, or, or they are not maybe interested. Uh, in covering these stories. What we see every day, every day from killing and punishment people, the, the, the punishing people and the, the um, uh, uh, punishing even uh, the Bedouins who are uh, uh, trying to push them from their lands where they really, uh, uh, they were born and they raised their kids and they are there trying to, uh, uh, to live uh, in peace. But also yeah. on the other hand, they are pushing them. What happened in Masafir Yatta is really, really very hard. And I don't know until when the people there can handle the situation, uh, and until when the people in, the, in Jerusalem can handle the situation, until when people in, uh, uh, and Palestinians in uh, uh, the Jordan Valley can handle this. You can uh, stay uh, uh, without water and electricity for a week, a month, a year, but you can't stay there ever. You are not allowed to live a normal life because you are a Palestinian, because the Israeli government uh, meant to push Palestinians uh, from their land so they can confiscate the, uh, these lands and build more settlements and build and expand the, uh, the, the settlements uh, uh, which is uh, already existing. We saw many stories there, but unfortunately, even if we cover it, I don't see any reaction from the international community about like uh, uh, questioning Israel about what is, is, is happening. Why Palestinians have always to move from place to another? Why they do not feel that they are secure? Why the kids are not feeling that they are secure? Why our kids are not feeling that they are similar to other kids and children around the world? Why we are really every time, every hour, we are afraid that something will happen to our kids because the soldiers are running after them, because the settlers are running after them. Of course, if there is no punishment for the settlers of what they are doing against the Palestinians, of course they will do uh, more and more. And, and even like no entrance this is, this is the question that even from the American government, we always hear uh, 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 different things. And sometimes we feel that uh, uh, um, this government will be better than the old government. But the, by the end of the day, we Palestinians feel that nobody is supporting us. There is no equality 
here. There is no justice here in Israel, Palestine, where we were born and raised. This is the issue. Why you feel nervous? You feel nervous because you don't know what will happen now after one hour tomorrow for your kids. You don't know if you will stay in your home or you will be forced to demolish your house. You know that Palestine, in Palestine, in Jerusalem mainly, we are forced to demolish our house by ourselves. Have you ever heard this story in any country around the world? You know what, what is the reason be, be behind uh, us demolishing our homes? Israel pretend that we do not have any permits to build uh, uh, houses or to expand our house. Because Palestinians never, I don't want to say never, maybe like 5% of the permits that we apply for the Israeli uh, municipality in Jerusalem, maybe 5% only will receive, okay, and the 95% of the, um, the uh, applications will uh, be denied by the government because they don't want to see more Palestinians in East Jerusalem. And then Palestinian families decide to demolish their homes by themselves because within, within what Israel is doing, they are demolishing our homes and they will send us the fee, which is around sometimes between eight to $10,000 for the bulldozers and the security and the dogs who were in the area while the bulldozers are demolishing uh, our homes. This is why some Palestinian families do not have the, the money. So sometimes they decide to demolish their homes by themselves, at least because they want, they can't pay the, the fees to the uh, Israeli government. Can you imagine this is happening in Israel? Can you imagine this is Israel, the democratic country? This is, these are the real stories on the ground. Come and see and witness and hear these stories from the people themselves who now they have a serious problem with their kids because the kids themselves can, uh, can't understand why their parents decide to demolish the house, why they decide to demolish their bedroom, why they decide to leave this house. They can't explain to them, to their kids who are still kids and they can't understand, they will have serious problems with them. And I wrote about this in one of my articles that there is now some of the problems between the families, the kids and their parents, because the kids saw their parents demolishing the houses, the house by themselves, and they are planning them and they decide even not to deal with their parents. This is a real stories happening on the ground in Jerusalem. But there is nobody interested in supporting uh, uh, justice here in this area because this is Israel. This is Israel. Thank you so much for that, uh, Rula, for that wider context on uh, demolitions, evictions, uh, more broadly than in Masaf Diata. We want to take the many questions that are uh, gathering in the Q&A section from our audience. Before we do that, we have one more short question for the two of you. Uh, so far, you both spoke about what is happening right now, about demolitions, about Israeli policies. What we want to talk about as publishers of Plus 72 magazine and Local Call, the two of you are journalists. The tool that you both have chosen to use um, to make a difference is journalism. Uh, Basil writes for 972 Magazine and Local Call. Uh, Rula writes for Man, has her own talk show and writes for the New York Times. You both uh, have different various platforms. Uh, right now, how do you see the value of being journalist? How is that connected to the struggle? And particularly right now, what are the dangers involved? for especially Palestinian journalists on the ground uh, and the context obviously of uh, the killing of Shireen Abu Akleh last week. Basil himself, I should mention, was attacked by soldiers just last week uh, and badly beaten. Um, so, so if you can both briefly share before we can take the questions from the audience, why you chose journalism and what does it look like being a journalist right now? Uh, yeah, we're, we're really like, we're really so sad, like about the killing of Shirin Abakli. Me, myself, I, I saw like, and I've been following up, like how really 
all Palestinians were sad and more not just Palestinians but in Palestine especially it was really sad day and a black day even uh, I felt the the sadness in, in everyone even the people here in the area remember what like we were talking about it uh, and about her and about her Roberts in, in Masaf Riyata even all people who remember her before nine years she she came and and uh, I did a report exactly talking about the situation that it's happening today uh, in Masafriyata. And more than that, she come and cover different stories in Masafriyata. And I believe in all West Bank, she have been doing this. So we're, we're really sad about uh, she got like shot and, and died. And I believe everyone, uh, but to be like, and a journalist in daily life under the occupation and the activists it's not easy but on the other hand i i see that this is very important and the thing that i believe in it and they want to do it because i believe in the past for example in the second father and before the occupation uh i've been the only the, almost the only the only one who's like doing the crimes and showing and like Showing the opposite to the world, showing the Palestinian terrorists, showing that they are de the Israeli army is defending Israel and the Israeli citizens, which is not true. And our cameras today, our phones, our writing, uh, our stories today, uh, is we're we're telling the truth to the world. We're showing what's happening. We're documenting their crimes. So so for that, they they killed Shirin Abakli. For that, they uh, they attack me. They we are not like. There's a lot of violations against the journalists in West in uh, in Palestine. Uh, that they bombed the bridge of the journalists in in Gaza last year. Uh, so they they're really chasing the cameras, uh, the cameras and and journalists, the writers who are writing about the truth. For me, it's important because I I I saw the effective of of the work that we are doing. Of writing and documenting since last year until until now and it continue and hope will continue more that we are really creating a uh, 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 we're showing at people believing and we're showing because we're showing them the truth or at least on social media so we're we're a bit changing the mainstream media on the world uh, to tell also the truth not just to, to say the Hasbara and the propaganda that the Israeli army is sending to them and showing them. Because we are, and for me, I have this as, as my, uh, as, as the only tool, for example, I'm, I'm carrying my camera and my, um, and my voice and to write about what's happening, writing the stories of the people. So I believe in it and I want to face this occupation with the tools that I have, showing the world and create the pressure uh, again, against it to stop it. Thank you, Basil. Rula, before we open up to Q&A, would you like to add anything briefly to what Basil just shared? Yes, uh, thank you, Basil. I think I will not repeat what Basil said, but I will add that it's really, I believe that the work that we are doing is really very important. We are telling uh, uh, the truth about our people. And I believe that maybe like a few of us are available to have the chance to talk to the international community, to be the bridge that, the, that they are allowed to take the stories from the community, from our community and take it to the international community to tell them this is the situation on the ground. Um, um, you have to do something. And now after uh, people, after they hear about the situation, I think that they can keep silent. This is the important thing. Sometimes people keep silent because they don't know. But once they know, I think they can keep silent. And I believe personally, while I'm touring in my country and hearing different stories uh, from different people, I feel that they are telling me this because they trust me. And, and, and because of my work, I have to tell the story of these people. Like Shireen, what happened to Shireen Abu Akle? We worked together for years and I was shocked and I wasn't able even to sleep for at least four days, four nights. I was running from place to place just 
uh, watching uh, uh, how people really love her, how people respect her, the way how she was killed because she's a journalist. I think Israel now really feel afraid and they feel that they need to close all the and shut all the mouths and uh, uh, attack more journalists because they feel that this is the real weapon. The real weapon is our cameras, our microphones, uh, our uh, uh, writing and reporting from the ground. We will continue doing this work. And I know that we will find a lot of people who really trust us and support us. And I believe that one day and hopefully sooner, we will change the situation on the ground. I don't think that uh, uh, our new generation, our kids can really continue living under occupation. We can't handle it. This is why we are doing. We are doing our work because we don't want, uh, want our kids tomorrow to blame us that you did not do anything to change the, the situation. We want to see uh, Palestine free. We want to live uh, uh, in a free country. We don't want to live under occupation. Uh, I was born uh, uh, during the occupation and I still, I am like around 50 and I still live under the occupation. I'm really, tired from the occupation. I want to return and live like normal life, like anybody else to travel, to go and see different people. I don't want always to cover the sad news. I don't want always to cover the killing and attacking people, demolishing houses. I want to see and highlight success stories, hope that I uh, 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 hope to see uh, uh, in the eyes of the young generation. This is why I keep doing this work. Thank you so much, Rula. Um, I want to open this up to some of the questions that we've received in the Q&A box. For those who are who have a burning question and that you haven't yet added, please do so. Um, and I want to, want to stay on this line of what we can do about what's happening. Um, we've heard a bit about how Rula and Basil have committed themselves to getting these stories out. Um, and I, I want to actually ask you, Basil and Rula, and invite you to speak a little bit about what you know. Many of the people in this audience today are calling in internationally. Um, a good chunk from the United States, across Europe. I'm seeing uh, Mexico. I saw earlier. Um, what can folks on this call do? What is the need right now at this particular moment around Massa Ferrieta and more broadly? I think Rula, you also spoke earlier very beautifully and powerfully about um, the fact that Israel's impunity and lack of accountability is fueled by um, US complicity um, and the silencing, the silence of the United States, if not the problematic behaviors of the United States in supporting the Israeli government and its actions. Um, so I wanna hear a little bit in this moment, um, given where we are, Basil, um, what is the call of the community right now in Masa Firiata? Um, and Rula as well, if there are specific things that you would like to call on this, this audience to do. And sorry, Basil, one more piece to that is if you can share a little bit about what response you've seen from the international community thus far, that would also be helpful. Uh, until now, no serious like uh, reactions on that from the international community. I mean, from the former, uh, from the former, the, the people who are making the decisions. I mean, the diplomats and uh, foreign uh, ministers uh, around the world, uh, or people who are making the decision to really writing to Israel seriously about the issue of Masafriyata. Like in the, in the Congress, in the EU Parliament, we need like letters to be sent from there to the Israeli government to stop the demolitions and the evacuations in Masaf uh, Also, the people like there, we need them to talk more and to write and to publish and to connect with journalists to talk about Masaf I mean, I believe people have a lot, can do a lot uh, internationally, even protesting or sending like letters to their diplomats that they need to move. Now is the time to, to take action against this by let them moving and sending letters and taking serious actions against this. Uh, not just like to write to Israel, but even like to, 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 to take action against it and to take it seriously uh, about what's going on in Masafir Yatta. 
uh, yeah, that's like people can help also on social media by writing and publishing and uh, sharing what we are writing. And Rula, would you like to add to that at all? I will agree with what Basil mentioned, but I also will uh, uh, want to see uh, uh, people uh, who are listening or who can take actions to write to, the, to their congressmen or congressmen and tell them that this is happening in, in Israel, Palestine, uh, that the, the, the money, the, uh, uh, the taxes that is coming and supporting Israel, the taxes and those who are paying the taxes, they are killing us and they are really pushing people from Masaf al Yatta and they are giving more power to the occupation and they are giving more power to the Israeli government to push us and to confiscate more land and to build more settlements. We don't want to see the money. We are not against Israel to exist. We are not against. We want to be there, to be here. I think our land we can both exist in this land. We don't want to see the hate, the hateness, and we don't want to see the killing because more killing means more, more hateness. Our kids can't even uh, 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 think that they can live uh, in peace with the neighbors if they are killing uh, uh, their friends and their parents and their family members. We want to see peace here in this land. And I believe that everyone one can do something by writing, by sharing our stories, by writing to the congressman or congresswoman, by uh, writing to the government, by doing something, push the American government or the European country, uh, push those to do something to help us come on the ground and see the situation and write. I, I really uh, would like to see journalists, uh, 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 cameramen, filmmakers to come here and to see, and I don't want to tell them anything. They can go there and they can see the situation on the ground and then they can write, publish or film anything about the situation. This, I trust them. Come and see the situation. If you can handle it for one week, then leave us alone. We can handle it forever. But if you can't handle it for one week or one hour, how we can handle it? How our kids can handle it? I mean, we need somebody to, to hear us, to listen to us, to do something, take action. We don't want people always to see that, okay, I hear the Palestinians, but they are terrorists. We are not. We are not terrorists. We are not. We are people who are searching to live in peace, in, in, in equality, in, in justice. We are not terrorists. We are uh, teaching our kids uh, uh, in private schools, in good universities, because we want them, we are investing in their education. But Israel and the Israeli government and the settlers are not really giving us uh, uh, the chance to do this. Help us, help us, please. Rula, thank you. And I think, you know, I want to just pull out a couple of um, threads in what both Basil and Rula shared, uh, because I think many in the audience are, 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 have been pointing to this. Um, one of the things that we've learned at Just Vision and Local Call and 972 is that in the absence of political leaders doing the right thing and in the face of um, Israeli impunity, it's incredibly important that we get these stories out accurately and that we push international communities around the world to be paying attention to what's happening on the ground. Um, it is insufficient, but it's a necessary component in changing the conversation on what's happening in Israel-Palestine and making sure that communities, whether it's Masa Feriata or it's Sheikh Sharach or it's Silwan or it's uh, communities in the Nakab, or beyond um, have a spotlight on the atrocities that they are facing, the violence that they are facing um, and their calls for change, their calls for freedom and rights. Um, I wanted to um, bring this um, back to with the remaining time, we will likely go just over the hour because I do wanna make sure we can get to some of the factual questions that are in the chat box as well. For those who have asked and um, about the resources in our chat box. We will be uh, following up with everyone on this call with resources and additional ways to get involved, including links to 
uh, the campaign to save Massa Ferriata, uh, resources and articles that have been dropped into the chat. Um, there have been questions around where to direct resources. Um, we'll make sure that those kinds of questions get uh, responded to in the follow-up email. In the meantime, I want to come back to this question around the organizing basil that has been taking place in Massa Ferriata. One of the things that has been incredible is that despite the severe uh, Israeli settler violence, again, sadly, oftentimes in collusion with the military and soldiers, um, the community in Massa Ferriata has done a lot more than um, than uh, simply staying on the land. There's been organizing, very strategic organizing that's been taking place oftentimes in uh, allyship with um, or solidarity from international and Israeli audiences and communities. Can you speak a little bit about what that organizing has looked like in Massa Ferriata? Um, for those who are curious about it. I also want you to, if you can speak to, um, someone asked this question about, did I hear you correctly that there are Israeli settlement outposts in the firing zone? Um, can you say something about that as well? Can you make sure to come back to that fact? And I think we got Murphy's Law. As soon as I punted it to Basil, he froze. So what we'll do, Hagai, can I send this to you in terms of taking the conversation to the next place with Rula and we'll get Basil when he comes back online. Oh, wait a second, it looked like Basil might be coming back. Basil, are you with us? Yes. Uh, yes, actually within the two within the two within the two thousand, there was like uh, five outposts created in 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 Masafariata. Uh, at least two of them like part of part of it were created in the firing zone area and they got all the structures that they want from the state like with water electricity homes and roads and security uh, and everything that they need that the army is preventing us to build on our land uh, also this is like last year they created two another farms like uh, sh grazing farms for the sheep uh, and from there they commit like uh, pogroms and attacks against us uh, against our communities the 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 and also like in the 28th of september last year they they uh, commit a pogrom against mufagara community where over than uh, 60 mosque settlers come out from the outpost of Abigail and Khabat Ma'on, which is part of this outpost created in the firing zone and attack the community of Mufaggara. They smashed all windows and doors and the properties uh, and the homes of the, the, the people, as well like all vehicles and tractors were damaged. 12 people got injured and including like three years old child who was hit by a stone in his head. After two months from that, like in November, settlers go deep in like in the firing zone uh, during the day and create another farm uh, and the ship shelter and a, and a tent on a hill between the communities. We went there to demand the army like to to take it out because it's built on the on the people land uh, and the army and settler planned to to commit a, a settler's attack against us who were there, the, the owners of the land, the, us as the activists and the people who was photographing that, uh, they planned the attack to happen during the night. And it was all the, the most scary moment in my life because the settlers were shooting fire life bullets, the army were uh, on the outpost next to them, like the, the army left to the outpost away and leave the Palestinians and the settlers in the place uh, and they were very sure that the settlers have guns and the sticks and all weapons they need. Uh, and after the army just left, the, the settlers start to throw stones and burning like the trees and as well shooting fire like bullets. Two guys were shot by these bullets in their hands and were like so many bullets shot to our direction. We were hiding behind the stones as well as cars were like smashed with their stones. 40 minutes like of violence was going on from the settlers toward us until the army come back and like taking everyone out from the land. Thank you, Basil. 
Thanks so much. Um, Rula, do you have any additional final notes? We are coming to the end just before so had I kind of part and close this session. Do you have any final notes on these questions to the audience? Uh, I think Basil said a lot about that, but I will add that uh, I think if we'll find a way to support people in Musafir Yatta and stop uh, uh, with them and support them and uh, maybe stop the uh, uh, eviction orders and try to do something to support the community. I think then we can really uh, uh, have a success stories uh, that uh, other people in different areas can feel that the international community or part of the international community or other people around the world are watching them, hearing them, supporting them. Because uh, uh, when I was uh, in uh, um, 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 around, around um, uh, Jordan Valley, I heard from different people there that uh, from the Bedouins community, that people like international people, like with the diplomatic missions and ambassadors and international media are coming they are taking photos and filming and then they will leave the area nothing happened nothing was a change i think really people here want to see that there is an action there is like people are listening to them uh, um, hearing uh, their painful stories uh, uh, they were with them on the ground and they did something to support them i don't think that just hearing and listening and keeping the information inside us is the the best way to support the community i think people want to see that there's an action there's something like I know that a lot of activists uh, from around the world, from uh, from Israel, they were supporting people in Masafir Yatta, they were supporting people in Shir Jarrah, in Silwan, in other places in the Jordan Valley. But I don't think that this is enough. This is very important, but still we need like uh, another actions to be taken. And I think your voices like um, uh, help us to uh, uh, take these stories, share uh, our stories to your community, to the people around you, uh, to your family members, to your friends. I think if people start talking about it, something will happen. I don't think that we need to keep silent. We need really to help, at least, at least by sharing our stories, if you do not have the power to do anything uh, else. And of course, thank you for giving us the time uh, and uh, uh, to listen to our uh, painful stories, but real stories also. Thank you so much, Rula and Basil. Um, Basil, I wanted to invite you if you have any final words for the audience as we come to a close. Yes, thank you again. And uh, as Rula mentioned, at least uh, for the people who's here to share our stories in Masafir Riyata, uh, to make everyone aware of what's happening. Thank you. One of the things that I want to share as we um, begin to close is just a reminder that what we're facing in Israel-Palestine requires a deep sense of long-term thinking and urgent, simultaneously with a sense of urgency. Um, we know that the work ahead of us is going to be long and will take a, our, our deep, deep focus. Um, we're really calling on communities to stay focused on what is happening on the ground in Israel, Palestine, to make sure others are paying attention to it as well, while calling on your political leaders um, here in the United States, but also around the world, for those of you who are um, calling in globally, to um, hold Israel to account. Um, again, I think one of the key things to remember here is that Israel is only able to operate in this way um, when people are silent and when governments are silent. And um, through grassroots mobilization efforts and also through the telling of stories and what is happening on the ground with an accuracy um, and ensuring that Palestinian voices are being centered in those stories becomes critical in the work we have ahead of us. Um, thank you for everyone um, in taking the time today to be with us. We will be following up um, with resources uh, around what's happening in Masa Theriata, um, as well as ways to stay in touch and to get involved. 
this is going to be a long-term campaign. Um, we started to cover what's been happening at Masa Fariyatsa years ago, um, early in the launch of um, Sikhama Komit and with Basil coming on board as a, as a team member, recognizing that sadly, um, the Israeli high court's decision wouldn't be a, wasn't a surprise to us. That's the unfortunate truth. Um, we've been aware that this was on the horizon. Um, and it's it's something that we hope becomes a galvanizing um, and, and a, a galvanizing force and a catalyst for audiences around the globe. Um, and, and, and so we really hope that we're, we're all organizing and thinking about what is very devastating and deeply challenging as an opportunity to get involved um, and to raise and sound the alarm um, with our communities, our friends, our political leaders and beyond. Um, so you will be hearing from us, in other words. You will continue to hear from us on what is happening in Masa Fariyata. We are not going anywhere. We ask you to come with us um, and we look forward to being in touch. Hagai, can I invite you to say anything as we close? Well, thank you, Sayed. Uh, I just want to join everything you said. I think we have recently seen two high court cases in Israel with different results. In the case of Sheikh Jarrah, we've seen the high court um, gradually trying to back down from evictions. This isn't a war that's won, but it's one where the high court takes into consideration the international ramifications for Sheikh Jarrah. In the case of Masaf Yata, the court felt that there are no international ramifications. The difference between these two places, they're both facing evictions. One has, thanks to the work of groups like Just Vision, like 972 and, and activists on the ground have gained international attention and support for Sheikh Jarrah. What we're trying to do right now is do the same from a from for the Jordan Valley, for other communities in East Jerusalem. By paying attention to all these communities and getting support for those communities, we can really make a difference on the ground. Uh, I just pasted some links on the chat. We will also make all these links available and the recording of this webinar available to everyone who was here. Um, so we'll, you will have the information, you will have the uh, option to follow us through our newsletters and be informed and share this information further with others. Please do that. It really makes a difference here on the ground. Can I say one last sentence, please? Of course. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, first of all, I always say that we do not need any uh, funds or like finance. We are not searching for any financial support because we are searching for something which is more important than financial support here. But if you really uh, trust the work that we are doing through Just Vision and through Local Call, I think we need your support to Just Vision and Local Call to do the work that we, to continue the work that we are doing. By supporting Just Vision and Local Call, this means that you are supporting people on the ground. We do not need the support to come to us as people or individuals or like a communities here because we need your voice to support us in other ways. Talk to your congressman or write about the situation here or join uh, uh, webinars like this through Just Vision and Local Call but, uh, or 972. But anyway, if you need to support um, uh, organization that really people here trust, that they are highlighting the work that people are doing here on the ground, that they are telling the truth of Palestinians and Israeli uh, activists who are supporting the Palestinians here through your support to Just Vision and Local Call and uh, 972. This means that you are supporting the community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. We will be in touch. Have a good evening, a good afternoon, a good morning for everyone here today.